May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Speaking in liturgical year terms, we are at that point in the year, the point that some refer to as ordinary time. Ordinary time, which to us in the 21st century sounds as though this is a time that nothing special happens in the church year, and we just sort of coast along until it becomes Advent again, and you know, it's just before Christmas. Sort of a place to mark time, as it were. But if we're to take a look at the etymology of the word ordinary, we would find that its roots go back to the Latin, and that root translates into order or ordered. And a further small dive into its origins finds that the word ordained has the same root. To be ordained is to be ordered. To enter into the season of ordinary time is to enter into a season that is order. This is the time of year. Well, this and the short season of Epiphany, which by the way, is also referred to as ordinary time. These are the times where we follow Jesus, his disciples in tow, as he begins his mission of healing, preaching, teaching, and gathering large crowds who listen to and are inspired by his presence. This is the season where we hear of miracles and parables and the very basic lessons we need as our foundation if we are to continue to be Christ's hands and feet on earth, if we are continuing to strive to bring about the ever-breaking-in reign of God. Ordered time, ordinary time, ordained time. So we have left the arrival of the Holy Spirit and the strength of the Holy Trinity in our daily lives. And this morning, we find ourselves right in the middle of a large crowd pressing in on Jesus so much so that he and the disciples are unable to even eat. And there in the crowd, we find people we just don't hear very much about. Jesus' mother, his brothers, and his sisters his human family. The angry portion of the crowd that had gathered were comprised of scribes who were more than a little upset at the teaching and moreover the inclusion of absolutely everyone that Jesus was promoting. And having accusations of being aligned with Beelzebul and was having the effect of riling up the remainder of the crowd in a very dangerous way. More than one commentary on this passage placed the family in a somewhat distressing place, one that implies that they are taking the side with those who are questioning by whose authority Jesus was casting out demons. The family's rushing in to restrain Jesus has been interpreted as trying to silence him because the commentary goes, they all think him to be out of his mind. I think. Perhaps there's a different way to view the actions of those who had known Jesus the longest. I see the families rushing in to restrain him as more of an act of protection and of love for the son and brother that is suddenly in the middle of not only a large crowd, but a very angry mob as well. And Jesus, you know, being Jesus, tries to teach with a parable about how it's impossible for him to be aligned with demons and cast them out at the same time, telling him things such as a house divided against itself cannot stand. And then he offers a definition of eternal sin and the irate crowd, seeing that his family is calling to him, tries to get him to disengage. And that is where perhaps the most challenging of all the statements in this passage appears. Not only for the crowd, but for us as well. For the gospel tells us Jesus' response is looking at those who sat around him. Here are my brothers and my sisters. Not, and my mother, not just those people outside, but here 
Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Or as poet and songwriter and retired Methodist pastor Stephen Garnis Holmes wrote and so kindly put in my mailbox this week, in a culture where family is right up there with God, maybe higher, Jesus says, yeah, family is it. But family isn't blood. It's love. Without, by the way, a, quote, father, end quote, an authority figure, just God. We have, as societies throughout time, been very good at determining just who is in and who is out, who belongs and who is forever the outsider. Rules that have been instituted by humans so that it is easier to move in and around society, so that it is easier to, to define one's place in the world. Garnis Holmes continues, no more tiny family with my little fence around who I care for, who I'm responsible to. While the hard news to hear is that all throughout history, there exists sets of rules and gates and fences to protect the tidiness of our lives. The good news is that the truth is those barriers can and have been overcome. For we are always evolving as children of God. For example, growing up at St. Paul's on the Hill, I thought becoming an acolyte would be the most amazing thing ever. But the rule determined who was in and who was out, and at that time had decided that acolytes could only be boys. And if I wanted to serve, which was a good and noble thing to do, I could join the, alt the junior altar guild and serve along with my mother, which, by the way, I did. Today in the Episcopal Church, girls and women can not only serve as acolytes, they can be on the vestry, be lectors, become deacons, priests, bishops, even a presiding bishop. And yes, they can still be on the altar guild, which now admits both women and men. June is Pride Month. And again, there was a time when Pride Month, let alone celebrating it or even recognizing it, was something that, well, kind of sort of just wasn't mentioned. Today, the church embraces all of its LBGTQ sisters and brothers. We celebrate their presence and their gifts and give thanks for their lives and in and around our church. And those of us who read Cast can tell you what had been done in the past to our Black sisters and brothers due to rules commanded by folks who felt that they had been placed by Providence just a little higher on the rung of the ladder. Rules that were indeed unjust and how we as an ever evolving society have dismantled some of those rules and are working together with all of God's children to dismantle the rest. Garnis Holmes concludes, you have given me this infinite family. All those who follow you differently than I do, I belong to them. We are one. I am to care as much about strangers as my own sister, respect opponents no less than my own brother, honor people so unlike me, as my own mother. And this is the miracle. Though it seems hard to love them all as if they are mine, when I do, I come home. Everyone is included, Jesus says. Everyone has an equal place at the table. Love God, love all your neighbors. It really is that simple. And that complicated. This is the challenge of today's gospel lesson. This is the message that the crowd gathered with the scribes found to be so blasphemous that they thought Jesus had to be out of his mind. Yet this is the hard and ever-evolving work that we do. 
through our baptisms have been called to do. This is what defines us as Christians. For this is ordered, ordained, ordinary. Amen.